Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my guest today, Tom Waddleman, is uh, we are longtime friends of about two weeks. <laughs> 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 I actually, that has been almost exactly two weeks Tom, since, since we met. I, and I met Tom at the AICPA Digital CPA Conference in mm -hmm. Nashville and through um, a gentleman by the name of Hugh, and I'm, I'm blanking on his last name. I don't remember Hugh's last name either. He was an Omaha-based CPA. Yeah, Omaha -based, we met, yes. Yeah, who, who saw me uh, speak at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and you guys were sitting at the table. Uh -huh. uh, you were the only one with an iPhone, by the way, if I remember correctly. And Everybody they were else giving you a hard time, yes. Yeah, they were giving you a hard time. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I spoke to Tom while I was there. After getting to know him, I said, I'd love to have you on my podcast. So first and foremost, thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule the week of Christmas uh, to be on my podcast. Oh, thanks for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to more conversation with you. Yeah, this, this, this is going to be fun. Uh, but I do it. So you are, you are a virtual CFO. Correct. And you've been a virtual CFO for four years, correct? Right. Okay. Yes, that's correct. So that's kind of, you know, I, I can pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. virtual, uh, but even through that prior to the pandemic and through the pandemic, what tends to be the biggest challenge that you run into as a virtual CFO when you're working with your clients? Oh, that's a great question. Probably the biggest continual challenge is that you're not with the client day to day to know some of the backstory of what things are going on. So you come in and meet with them. I feel like I get to know things really well, but I do have to rely on their knowledge of their business for what things are going on. It probably makes some of our conversations more interactive though, because if I'm reviewing a financial statement, oftentimes I'll say, here's what we're seeing. What is going on here with this extra spending with this particular vendor? And if you were internal, you might have them saying, well, you should know you're here every day and see the decisions we make or things like that. Did it there. That's probably one. And then the other, I think a lot of CPAs probably can align with the time management piece is you have multiple clients. Mm -hmm. Every single one wants something. And there are, of course, days where there are five or six fires and being client facing, you can never go to one client and say, hey, this client has something that's more important. Are you OK if I don't treat you as important <laughs> as this other person? When, <laughs> As you know, I worked for a big company before and things were busy, right. but I always had usually had one boss that you could go to and say, OK can't get it all done. What are we going to negotiate here? So that probably is the other challenge is just managing time and how you get everything done for the clients. Yeah. Time management, juggling clients, I, even, yeah. even though you're, you're, you work for um, some CPA group and they, they're operating like a, a public accounting firm, but you, but you're in-house as a, as a CFO helping yes. your clients navigate their business. Mm -hmm. And all clients have, have different attitudes and, and different uh, thoughts. Do you tend to stay within one type of industry or, or do you do work across industries? So it's sort of both. Um, the company has a niche around creative agencies and it's a little bit more than half of our clients. So companies that work internet, web presence, digital marketing, search engine optimization, things like that. And their main business model for this group is for the most part, hours billable times an average rate gets you toward your revenue. So very similar to many CPA firms and law firms and things like that. So in that niche, we can then say, okay, let me help you plan your revenue. I think you've got the capacity to do this much because of this many hours times this rate. And we've got some really nice measures and people will ask me, what do you see across the industry? And I've got enough clients in that, that I can do comparisons across that. That's a little bit more than half my clients. And then I do have transportation, manufacturing, education, some that just really don't fit that model um, that are, are unique. And you, you do have a, uh, lack of a better term, an IT background from your previous employer. I do, that's true. Yeah, I started off, my undergraduate degree is technology and I started off doing programming and technology. So it is actually an area that I like and I, I couldn't program to save my life today, <laughs> but I do know some of the terms when they talk about it and the importance of things. And that has certainly helped that any client who feels like you sort of know their business, it certainly gives an advantage. So you understand the foreign language of IT when you're hearing IT from the IT provider? In some cases, in some <laughs> cases. I do have a client doing government work who just won a contract for all COBOL 
programming, right? Those who don't know, COBOL was invented in the 50s yeah. and phased out by most people in the 80s, except for our government. So now they're hiring these people and talking about these guys with 35 years. Exp- and I mentioned, I used to program COBOL and they're instantly saying, do you want to work for us? I said, no, nah, <laughs> you don't want me programming COBOL now. Um, but so that's one of the only, now they're all in languages that I've heard of, but you know, have just barely heard the names of them. So do, do you run, so you're working primarily with, with CEOs of these different organizations. Do I do, you, yes. Do you run into that challenge of the deer in the headlights look or that challenge of, um, Tell it to somebody else. I want to just, I just give it to me up here. Stay out of the weeds. I do. Yes. <laughs> um, until things go wrong. And then they want to do this deep dive really far <laughs> in. Probably what I notice more often, though, um, and as I think of the way you t- have described things, I-, I can review things for a long time. And then people will ask questions that show they just weren't really even understanding some of the basics. You know, someone will be upset because they don't see a distribution on their income statement or something. And so I'll say, hey, we've talked about this. That's something that comes out over here. You won't see it here. But there are some other things that you'll feel like, okay, they've got it. You know, I did a great job delivering it in the last question. You're like, you really didn't understand or I didn't (laughs) deliver it well enough for you to do that. Right. So how do do you work with these guys, um, these CEOs and guys, gals, Mm -hmm. and, and get them to have a better understanding of what you're trying to come across with in in non-accounting lingo or acronym? Yeah, Um, it's a great question. I think it's probably two main things. In the financial statement review, we spend a fair amount of time on what we call the non-financials. So with these agencies, we have production metrics, for example, how many hours were billed, what's the, we call it utilization what percent were people billable? What was your average rate? And so we try to tell the story and could say, you can see revenue was down as you would expect. Your hours were down, your rate was down. Something where you're saying there's a consistency in the story. And then we also talk about taxes, cash, all those elements with it. And so really trying to build a story that comes together as well as you can. And I try to frame things in kind of, hey, here's what happened for the period that we're looking at in two or three sentences, and then try to support that as we walk through the financials. That's the main one. The other is the more they can be engaged in forecast conversations, the more that it helps when you review actual results because they're looking saying, hey, are you expecting to spend more in some of these areas? Recently, November, December, okay, client gifts, is that going to be big for you this year? And they'll say no, and then we'll do the financial statement. They spent $15,000 as an example. That could be one where you come back and say, hey, here's why we're over. Remember, we talked about this. You didn't think that you were going to spend and try to make that connection for them. Well, as you're, as you're describing that, I think the one thing that becomes even a, a, a big challenge for you guys, because like you said, you're not there. And, right. and, and if you were physically located at, the, at their plant, at, at their offices, mm-hmm. and, and a number wasn't what you thought it was supposed to be, you could get out of your chair and go and talk to the head of sales or the head, head of right. distribution. Do you still have that capacity or are you limited by that as a virtual CFO? We're somewhat limited. If there is an internal bookkeeper, we will ask them. Okay. And so the usual process, I have a senior accountant who works with me. And so if we look at things, we'll say, hey, can you go back and find out if this looks correct? Sometimes it's accounting related things, a really big invoice for software, maybe. And say, can you go check and see if maybe this is a year's subscription that we should be doing as a prepay Mm -hmm. item rather than just a monthly kind of thing? Sometimes it's just in the meeting, and that depends on how good my relationship is with the CEOs. After a couple of years, it seems to be pretty good where I sort of know when I can get away with just asking them during that meeting, hey, what happened in in this case? But of course, it's a little embarrassing if in that answer you find out something's not correct in the statement, then you realize, well, we shouldn't be here reviewing your results when I'm at the same time I'm finding out that this was, you know, a big customer deposit that shouldn't even be sitting in your revenue kind of a thing. Right. Um so when, when you first get put on, on a, get a client, uh-huh. how long, how long, it sounds like it takes about a couple of years for them to gain trust, or try, gain trust in you and you and them. Yeah. Um, hopefully it's not that long just to gain the trust, but there's definitely that ramp up it, probably a good four or five months for many of them. And I think like oh, lots good. of people, some probably don't trust you until you prove it. And some are pretty trusting until you erode it. We jump in and do a pretty intensive onboarding process for six to eight weeks where we're saying at the end of that, we're ready to deliver services. So 
the main activities are building a really good forecast that you believe in and revising your chart of accounts if it needs to be so that we can do reporting off of it. And then of course, getting access to whatever we need access. So through that, hopefully, like through the forecast, they're saying, hey, okay. this, is, this is pretty good. You understand my business well enough that I'm trusting your forecast. But then usually it does take a little bit of time to get through some that they're actually trusting that you've done things correctly. So I, I was out on your LinkedIn site uh, uh -huh. and I, I noticed, uh, I apologize if I, if I get this wrong, but I think you'll, under, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the Summit CPA group puts out a playbook. Is that, am I right about we that? We do. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and, and could you talk about that? Is, is that part of the onboarding process? Um, we use the playbook. So the playbook that we put out is for other CPA firms that would like to offer virtual CFO services. Oh, that's right. Okay. And so okay. we have a 15 module course that people can go through and we tell every single thing that we do and offer. Everyone wants to know about how we do pricing. So we will give them the pricing template. And here's how we manage people and a remote team and all those things. And that's really the playbook that we have. Oh, so that's that's another revenue stream for the CPA. It, it is. Most of it is helping all the people who want to continue client advisory services and expanding them, helping them do that. And then we have, I was just there today, we have a one hour meeting once a week with other CPA firms that can come in and ask questions about how we do things and we give coaching and guidance around that. So yes, there, there's some revenue. Most of it is just sort of expanding our, our reach. And, and it sounds to me like that part of... CPA firm businesses are, are growing fairly rapidly. Yeah, I think everyone wants to. E everyone, well, I shouldn't say everyone, many firms know they want to step into being that advisor role. Okay. And they look at their existing clients and say, I think there's a need there, but making that step to do it can be challenging. Um, and so that's where we're trying to help them say, here, here, here's how I would get to doing that kind of stuff if, you, if you're trying to do it. What type of challenges are there for, for a CPA firm to take on this new uh, revenue model? Yeah, I, I think the biggest initial ones are staffing is one because they all feel busy. And so then to say, can you do more is mm -hmm. a big one. Um, there are some technology pieces that if you're going to build a forecast and you're going to do good financial statement reporting and things like that, you need to have a consistent process for how to do it. I think a lot of it is a maybe a little bit of a fear of action to move that, you know, <laughs> CPAs are careful and they want to be perfect. So going into that first sales meeting and how do I price it and how do I do that? It's hard. And yeah. I know it's hard, but often we say, just do one. And you'll learn so much by just sitting down with a prospective client. A few yeah. have said, I offered to do it for free. I had this client, Peter, and said, I'm trying to expand service. What if I do it free for three months and we'll figure this out and then I'll start charging you. And we said, that sounds like a great model. If he's one that will help you, and sort of knows that he's getting it for free. And so he can mm -hmm. go through some of the initial learning bumps. That can be a really good strategy for doing that. Yeah, you're a CPA, but, but you get your CPA later in life. By the way, I did. Uh, to, my, to my audience, Tom has figured it out. He spent, I don't <laughs> know, 20 some odd years with, with uh, uh, Eli Lilly, yep. and took early retirement. And now he's working full time with the, the uh, Summit CPA group. Um, yeah. And he's double dipping, man. I tell you what, I, <laughs> God, I did this wrong. <laughs> uh, I do have friends there, but you're retired, right? I said, yes, I work harder than I ever did. <laughs> Probably I'm more stressed, but I'm having so much more fun. I'm learning, you know, you were, Lily is a huge multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. I learned so much coming in and starting to work with small businesses that, as you can imagine, we're in a big company. I was really good at a really small slice. I was in charge of our Sarbanes-Oxley compliance oh. at the very end. And oh. I enjoyed it, but you know, I didn't pay any attention to how money got in our bank or pay or anything. And then I come work with these small businesses and they ask questions and everything felt brand new for the first several months. And I had a huge sort of imposter syndrome and <laughs> our two owners kept saying, remember on the financial side, you know more than they do and you'll get this. And over time you quickly learn things. But I used to joke with my wife, so it was virtual. So I was meeting with them like I am with you on Zoom. Yeah. I said, if my clients could see what I was Googling during our meeting, they would be shocked <laughs> that I didn't know anything. <laughs> they were asking things. I'm like, that sounds familiar. So as I'm answering, I'm like, what is, you know, great, just terms that seem really basic to do it. So it was a great learning experience. Uh, ter terms for their business that they were saying to you. It was, yes. Yeah. I, I remember one specific that someone was going to give her a 
a loan. And they said, but they want it to be convertible. Do you think that's a good idea? And in my mind, I'm like, I haven't dealt with convertible debt for so long. Oh, yeah. And so I'm quickly Googling literally what is convertible debt. And luckily Google gives you those three sentences. I'm like, okay, I can at least sound intelligent. But when it hits you for the first time, my first reaction is panic and then forget everything you know. And then you're like, I don't want to look like an idiot doing this. And then you learn to relax and make sure you understand what you're doing. And oh, after, after a few years, I'm a little bit less concerned that they're going to throw a curveball that I've Never heard, but if they have, I'm okay saying, help me understand what you're trying to get and let me go back and come back with a thoughtful answer. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great story. Uh, yeah, and, and, and through this, you said you've learned a lot. What is probably the, the number one thing that you, uh, most of all that you've got? Oh, okay, that's what I learned the most and that's meant more in my ability to deliver my service to my clients. Oh, that's a really good question. Let me let me think about that for just a second. Yeah, I think, and there's an adage in consulting that they will, I'll, I'll totally get this wrong, but your clients will like you better if you just show that you know them and you're listening to them more than I'm an expert. And let me tell you how much I'm an expert. And so probably one of the biggest things that has helped me is I'm really good at taking notes. And usually before meetings, I'll review my notes so that I can keep track of, okay, here's what we talked about last time. I'm listening to you. You've talked about this for a long time and just making sure they know. It could be things like them telling you early on, hey, in 10 years, I'm hoping to sell this company and I want to, I want a house on the beach, something like that, where you're in long-term plans, you're continuing to say, hey, I know we've talked about this. This is getting you toward that direction that we're doing. I think kind of understanding where, what they've been talking about and that you're on their side to do that is probably one of the biggest um, things that's really helped me. Wow, um, that's that, that's solid. I mean, I the, the ability to listen to your client and not not speak at them but understand them is huge. And mm -hmm. and I mean, I've been I've been carrying that banner for a long time, and that's that's part of the reason why I, I got so involved in the world of improv because that's what improvisers do. We listen. Yes. Uh, we listen more and talk less in order to gain that understanding. And, and that, that begin that relationship um, and, and come at it from a two-way street, not a, not a lecture, but a, but a conversation. Yeah. And I'll admit one reason it's a learning for me is I don't think it's that natural in some cases. So growing up in a corporate world, presentations were a really big deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people would joke that our company, the, you know, the company was run by PowerPoint and things like that. But much of it was true that PowerPoint slides had hundreds of words and pretty much it was a presentation. And you came in having practice and it, it was your thing. Mm -hmm. So I come here and do financial statement presentations and it was a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And some of it, I'll admit, was probably a little bit defensive that, you know, if I can fill all the words, then they can't ask questions to show that I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I was also well prepared. I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here. Yeah. Jody, one of our owners, is good at just, hey, what do you want to talk about? I'll go kind of wherever you are. And I'm trying to go more that direction, but also just intentionally wanting to leave those pauses to say, how do you think things went and where else would you like to go to look in these statements so that I'm meeting your needs? Because most of the clients will just sit and listen to the whole thing and not interrupt and say, okay, you're not going where I want you to go for this. So that listening, I think, is one of the most valuable, but also one that I continue to try to, to I just have to keep learning it. But yeah, because because we we come into that meeting with, with an agenda and things we want to cover. Right. Yes. And a lot of times when, when that curveball comes, it goes into a different direction. It's like, okay, can we? I'm not going to use the P word's been overused way too much. Can we adapt? Can we adjust to that direction and, and kind of explore where, where they're going? Because you never right. know where that conversation will lead. And you know what? Maybe by the end of the conversation, there's a few things on your things that you wanted to talk about, but times are now, but that's okay. Yeah. Because you've learned a lot more about an insight that, that will serve you, serve you well down the road. Right. Exactly. And, and just being able to have them describe what they think and, and they'll feel like they've got so much more out of that conversation. So yeah. that's probably one, one of the biggest, and it, it does take patience. You know, you and I talked about being busy at the beginning <laughs> Sometimes when the conversation feels like it's waning early, it's easy to think, oh, good, if we get done early, then I can jump back to a long to-do list of things to do. And so there always <laughs> feels like this tension of saying, maybe the time is better spent just really trying to say, okay, how are things looking, anything we should be doing, things where you really want to focus on them. Yeah, kind of throw that to-do list away for, for, that period of, for that period of time while you're, because yes. yeah, it does wane in the back of our head. 
Right. And, and that weighing in the back of the head also creates a distraction in our mind, mm -hmm. which reduces our ability to listen. Yeah. So we're, in listening, we also need to be fully present. And, and a lot of times, CPA, we as CPAs are so gosh darn busy. Being mm -hmm. able to listen and being present is a huge challenge. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it's one we have to continually work at it, it doing really well with. Absolutely. absolutely. What did you say, Tom? I didn't quite catch it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, as, as we as we begin to wrap up, um, what is what is one thing that you and maybe we've already said it is it one thing that you would inform my audience or suggest to my audience that they should work on uh, if they want to be more client facing or be a better at client facing uh, situation? What's the one thing they should really go out and master? That's a really good question. I think one of the skills missing currently, if someone says, I want to move from maybe doing tax returns or compilations where it's a, I touch the client once a year, twice a year, mm. three times a year. And I think there's opportunity to do more than that. So I want to advise more. Mm. I think one of the skills that people could really build is the ability to do forecasting, mm. right? Okay. This move, and we've heard it in accounting for a long time. Clients don't really want to come having you explain the history. They want someone mm. to help them sort of go where they want to go. And I think what we have found is we've talked about some of the forecasting tools when we have these meetings with accountants. And I think that there's a gap and a skill that people just don't really know how to do that forecasting. It includes very much a listening. So help me understand your business well enough. What really drives revenue? Where are you going? And when you describe growth, what does that mean? How do I break that down to say, is it a certain number of client touches, a certain number of increasing marketing? What is it that's going to help you get toward that? And I think if someone was really good at that, you can imagine going to a client saying, how about together, I'm going to lead, we're going to get a map of where you want to go. And then I'm going to walk with you there, because of course, you're not going to take that exact route. And as you right. get off track, we're going to keep adjusting that all the way along. And I think that's where our clients, when we do it well, find the most value for our services. Because they're looking at next year saying, I got a good picture and I can even look at cash flow, lines of credit, how much money I can take out of the business, all the things when a forecast is good. You've got this picture saying, here's what we have to do. And if it's done really well, when I come and say, okay, we didn't meet our revenue targets, I should be able to look back and say, it's because of this. You thought you could get 5,000 per month per client and it's mm -hmm. really 3,000. Or you thought you could get X number of clients, it's less back in the terms that they understand versus just the dollars. So I'd come back to saying that forecasting skill. That is great advice and, and, and well done. Um, Tom, I can't thank you enough for taking time. I, I know that you're trying to get ready for vacation. Your clients are trying to get ready for no, vacation. Yeah, of course, so you, yes. you probably lined up uh, but I, first and foremost, one, I hope you and your family have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I look forward to our paths crossing in 2022. Me too. Thank you, Peter. This was very enjoyable. Happy holidays to you too.